Yeah, we're sticking with cricket on the Sports Max Zone, and we turn our attention now to some of the major talking points coming out of the two-day CARICOM conference on West Indies cricket, which concluded at the Hyatt Regency in Trinidad and Tobago earlier on Friday, where a few stakeholders, including Guyana President, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali, expressed views indicating that the rise of cricket in the neighboring territory of the USA is a potential menace to the sustainability of the sport in the Caribbean. And then we have the threats. We cannot leave this conference without discussing the threats. The threats with the growing North American cricket that can bring in a lot more fans, a lot more revenue. I believe that we need to examine whether we need to move West Indies Cricket Board, West Indies Cricket from West Indies Cricket Board to the American Cricket Board. Because we have to now work towards owning cricket in Americas. And how do we develop a strategy where West Indies Cricket become the owner of cricket within the Americas. These are things that I think we have to address. We have a threat coming, and it's a serious threat. The United States is waking up to cricket. The United States can build stadiums, they can, they can get promotions, and they can get the money through branding. The West Indies is one of the best brands. And I'll, I'll, I'll put an example to you. When COVID was in, and I repeat in, uh, 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 one of one of my colleagues, um, what he said to me, England had a serious problem of losing. Meanwhile, both Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley and former West Indies captain Sir Clive Lloyd questioned the rationale behind Cricket West Indies' 50-year agreement with the region's premier T20 franchise competition, the Caribbean Premier League. The is that our record of negotiations on behalf of West Indies cricket has left much to be desired. I want to see the CPL contract, not because I'm an interloper, but because I really believe that a contract that is so unequally yoked ought not to stand for 50 years. That's a half a century. How many cricketers gonna go through that half a century? But we sign, is it a 50-year contract? Who signs a 50-year contract? You know, I mean, it, it's so silly, it isn't fun. Now, if we were running our own CPL, we would have been able to give more, player, more money to the players, and they probably would want to play with, with us longer. But, again, how do you need, how can a board sit down and negotiate that? I, Still in the street me. I don't know how we can be talking to CPL about women's cricket or any other right without renegotiating the contract ab initio. In other words, from start. You cannot vary a contract without both sides agreeing to it. And if they wanted to have greater representation in other aspects of the game, that is when the West Indies Cricket Board should be holding them accountable to be able to renegotiate the kinds of rights that we have. And the legendary West Indies fast bowler, Jamaica's Michael Holding, was moved to tears while addressing the past as well as ongoing affairs relating to the sport in the region. A gentleman by the name of Richard, the English gentleman who was the liaison officer between the Azure and the West Indies Cricket Board, came to me at the back of the bus. I was sitting at the back of the bus on my own. Came to me at the back of the bus and showed me an accreditation printed for one of the gentlemen from the Azure. Printed and given to him by someone from the West Indies Cricket Board. Now we're talking about Johnny Walker. And Johnny Walker was spelled J-O-H-N-N-Y. Come on, folks. You have a sponsor putting thousands and thousands of dollars into your product, and you cannot even spell the sponsor's name correctly. I'm getting emotional about this thing that hurts me. We need to look after the sponsors because they are the ones who bring their money we need to make sure that they are happy and confident that their funds are being spent correctly, that someone isn't siphoning it off, as we have seen. And that way, we have a better chance of looking after our cricketers. If there is no cricket on the ground, all this love that Jack Callis and people around the world have for West Indies cricket, it will not last unless we are producing on the cricket field. No one is going to love West Indies cricket for the name West Indies cricket. 
They loved West Indies cricket for what we produced. Going back to Sir Larry Constantine, right through the doubles and Sir Vivian Curran cricketers. Yeah, so joining us via Zoom to put these comments and views into perspective, Fazir Mohammed in TNT. Faz, uh, we've had these discussions before at these levels, um, trying to tackle the issues holding West Indies cricket back. And somehow, I, 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 I'm getting the feeling here that, that people feel that this one may be a little bit more meaningful than some that we have seen in the past. I'm not sure where you sit. Well, I know you're sitting in your living room, but you understand what I mean. I understand what you mean. And uh, I would like to be optimistic, but I'm not. Uh, because essentially, uh, we, we all that you heard were variations of what we've heard before. Fundamentally, Lance, the issue is the governance model in West Indies cricket. Yes, we can talk about the territories, we can talk about the threat from the USA, we could talk about better contractual arrangements, we could talk about more money in the game, but essentially, and, and again, and I think quite a few of the luminaries referenced it, the many reports, the Patterson report, the Weeby report, the Wilkin report, the Eugene Barito report, which I think would have been the latest in 2015, 2016, they all amounted to the same thing, the fundamental flaws in the governance of West Indies cricket. And I didn't hear anything over the last couple of days that even attempted to deal with that fundamental issue. Mm. Faz, when the latest Cricket West Indies Congress um, snubbed the Webby report in its entirety, there was a comment from the current president, Dr. Kishore Shallow, that almost sounded apologetic almost sounded as if yes it, it wasn't it wasn't embraced but we are hoping that in time we we will have it embraced which suggested that he is in favor of these governance reforms but the body of the directorship didn't agree with him was that how you you took it well and that is the problem the, the problem with west indies cricket how is west is west indies cricket directors the fact of the matter is that they are not going to vote themselves out of office. They are not going to change the structure that alters their influence or diminishes their influence because they are not people of vision. Maybe one or two of them are. Maybe Dr. Shallow is. I don't know. Uh, because there, there seem to be a willingness to give him the benefit of the doubt. But the overwhelming evidence is that the directors are all about themselves, all about their particular territories, all about ensuring that their constituencies are satisfied that they are doing the best for them. So they are, in, in essence, glorified politicians who could care less about the, the wider welfare and the vision for West Indies cricket. The Barbados PM, Mia Amor Motley, had said yesterday during the conference, Faz, um, something that amounted to the, her feeling that more of these legends of West Indies cricket should be involved in the decision-making process of West Indies cricket. And while I, I know that, you know, people like Sir Clive Lloyd and so on have been managers of teams and so on, Ivia Richards had been a, a coach at one point, uh, Desi Haynes is currently a chairman of selection. Uh, do you think West Indies cricket would, have, would be better served if some of these iconic figures in West Indies cricket, like Sir Clive Lloyd, would be in the offices making these decisions? Lance, We've been hearing that, that refrain since Mia Amor Motley was in law school or probably an apprentice in, in chambers because that, that has been mentioned time and time again. And, and yes, there, there's certainly some, some, some relevance to it, but that is not the be and end all. They, 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 it's a comprehensive thing, Lance. You know, we, 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 we have this kind of piecemeal sort of thing, you know, bring back, let Sir Clive come and take control. Uh, he, he ran the West Indies team, but it was the most powerful thing in the world. He must be able to run West Indies cricket. Maybe, maybe not. But, but fundamentally, it has to be the structure because a structure that, that deals with transparency and accountability, a structure that, that rewards excellence and sidelines mediocrity or punishes mediocrity. But what we have is horse trading. And essentially, that, that is what we've been doing. We've, we got away with, with it for a long, long time. But the global environment has changed. 
to expose all of our frailties and shortcomings to the extent that, okay, yes, even if you were to name all the SIRS to the West Indies actual board of directors, what guarantee do we have that will make any fundamental difference to the governance of the game? Yeah, and you know, Faz, I want to stick with what Mia Motley said. Um, she went on also to speak about the 50-year CPL contract. And to me, you know, a lot of people were not aware of that because, you know, if you're not following cricket very closely or you're not following the headlines every day, news like this, it's very easy to slip you. I'd love to hear your take on that. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I was there at the launch of CPL in early 2013 in Barbados. Right. And at, at the time, West Indies Cricket Board, as they were known then, and uh, the, uh, uh, the the head of Cricket, Cricket West Indies at the time, uh, they, they were shying away from, from telling us the truth about that contract. Okay. Many, for those who might recall that time, there was an individual by the name of Amjad Khan, who was the front man for CPL in his first year. He disappeared after that first year. So, so again, people were asking the question, is it 25 years? Is it 50 years? Cricket West Indies or West Indies Cricket Board wouldn't say. And, and, and now Pete Russell, who spoke today, and I know our highlights just a while ago focused on the contributions yesterday, Pete Russell, the CEO of, of the CPL, brought that up. He said, there's obviously a fixation with that. But keep in mind that CPL have been losing money for the 12 seasons so far, for, for the 11 seasons so far. So they've been bearing the losses. And if Cricket West Indies wants to come on board and take some of the losses, fine. But the point is, yes, it reflects two things. One, an obsession by, with the politicians with this 50-year contract, fine, no problem. But also, the, the fact is that it is not sustainable financially. So if you were to open up the contract and shorten it, how, how is it going to be run? Who is going to run it? Will, will, will the CARICOM governments take on the losses? Because it's losing. Yeah. It's been losing money. It's been losing less money year on year, but it has yet to turn a profit. So while obviously there's, there's an issue with the, the contract, it speaks to two things, as I said. One, it's easy to talk about it, but can you put your money to, to, to match that? Yes. And two, the, the continued secrecy of Cricket West Indies and their operations. Yeah, and of course, well, I'm so happy that you are the one doing this segment because you have a first-hand experience, Faz, on what took place at that signing of the contract. So I'm, I'm re really pleased about that. Speaking about the finances, you saw the clip also with Michael Holding, of course, moved to tears when speaking about the sponsors. Your take on that? Well, it, it hurt me to see Mikey in that situation. I remember Sagafield Sobers when the West Indies were in Sri Lanka, moved to tears as well because of the same word he said. He said it hurts and his voice cracked when we, because, for, I, I mean, the, 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 the point is these individuals, have excelled under the banner of the West Indies. Mikey, fair, and, and fair point to him, pointed out as well that it's about seeking your financial well welfare. He talked about him leaving West Indies cricket with all of the other prominent players, most of them anyway, except Alvin Kali Charan, to go to Kerry Packer for a couple of years because it's about their financial well wherewithal. And that's why he made that point. You can't expect to attract the best commercial possibilities in the world when you have a bunch of bumbling incompetence uh, running around and, 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 and posing and posturing and pompousetting, to use Tony Cozier's word, in West Indies cricket. Yeah, but Faz, can you, can you honestly and accurately suggest that the past 30 years of West Indies cricket governance has been incompetent or substandard? Yes, Lance. Yes, I can. Because the, the, the fact of the matter is that if you have a model that is run effectively by politicians who refuse to step back and allow the professionals to make the decisions, they won't come forward and say it, but an, an array of people who have been in positions, whether CEO, whether COO, or any sort of O, or any sort of C, or any sort of hired position, 
in West Indies cricket have said that it ultimately it comes down to 12 politicians who can, cannot see beyond the borders of their own countries. So the fact that the West Indies continue to produce outstanding cricketers speaks to the bedrock of the game. I heard that reference to West Indies cricket being on life support. That is foolishness. West Indies cricket is not on life support, not when you have so many talents continuing to be produced, but the brand West Indies cricket in that sense and, and whether or not it will carry that same stature and, and level of representation in years to come, that is under threat by the Americas and by so many other things. But this region, because the, the game, whether we like it or not, it, it, it's, it's part of our of fabric of our society, like football, like athletics, like cycling, like so many other sports. We live and breathe it, maybe not to the, to the extent as far as the numbers are concerned, but still, and, and, and Lance, I can only speak from, from my own little experience. In our little area here, in my part of Trinidad, where we have a little coaching clinic running, you generally would have 60, 70 children, male and female, coming to do the drills and cricket every Sunday morning. And so that's a, a very tiny microcosm. So it's not about life support, it's about good governance, but those in charge refuse flatly refuse to even entertain the prospect of a good governance model. Mm. All right, Faz, we still have a lot more to talk about on this issue. Um, when we come back after the break, we'll talk a little bit more about what has happened today uh, because we did, you know, retrace our steps just now and, and looked at some of the comments made yesterday. But uh, stay with us, Faz. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs>